Bueno, hemos repetido una y otra vez durante esta charla de que las riquezas de la naturaleza no sirven sin el trabajo del hombre, ¿no es cierto? Pero ¿qué ocurre, vamos a ver ahora, con el trabajo del hombre o de la mujer, del ser humano, a través de la historia? We have repeated over and over again during these talks that nature's wealth does not serve us without human labor. Let's see now what happened with the work of human beings, men and women, through history. Is the way in which indigenous people saw the land in the past the same as it is today? Is its performance the same Did the production of sugar during slavery have the same performance that the industrial production of today? What we can see is that work performance has been increasing over time. Both the ability of the worker as well as the quality and complexity of the instrument of labor, the means of labor, have increased. We have a better raw materials. Polyester yarn is much stronger than cotton yarn and machines for sewing are much better. There is a huge technological leap from stone instruments to metal ones and later to the machines using capitalism. Labor productivity increases with the improvement of the instrument and the dexterity of workers. A worker spends less time to make a product when the machine or the raw material are better. When we speak about productivity, we are thinking about the amount of goods that you can produce in a given period of time. Consider, for example, the difference between the shovel and the manual laborer who digs a hole to repair a street and the large mechanical excavator of today. What a huge difference! And, as it is clear that productivity increases, We have to ask ourselves, what happened with the labor process? Does it remain the same? No, it does not. The sophistication of the instrument of labor, the degree of their complexity, produce changes in the way in which the labor process is done. This is very clear in the field of war, where we see that the invention of certain firearms change the way armies are organized. Troops are very differently organized when rifle, tanks, machine guns, or more recently, the anti-craft missiles are used. In the same way, a real transformation in the way of producing happens with this invention of certain instruments. And of course, the requirements for the personal ability of the worker wither away to the extent that the tools for working become more complex. It is evident as well that with these new technological inventions, the number of workers required to create certain products is reduced. The most obvious case is that of the industrialized agriculture. Today, only a minimum number of agricultural workers is needed to produce enormous quantities of food. Think about the difference between the tractor and the plow that was pulled by an animal. With a single machine that can do such amount of work, in many cases, it makes no sense for a small farmer to have a tractor. Extended lands are needed for a tractor to be useful. Otherwise, the tractor would stand idle for most of the day. When this machinery was introduced in agriculture, farm workers began to lose their job. This explains their displacement from the rural sector into the cities in search of work. We talk about machines when the tools manipulated before by several workers now become part of a great machine. This monster, as Mark called it, assumed most of the tasks that many workers did before 
and doing so, the process of production changes, and the role of the worker changes as well. Remember that at the beginning of capitalism, a worker required a number of quality to do his or her work, and there were workers who had more skills than others to do the same work. When the machine was introduced, the skill of the workers no longer counted. The worker is limited to fill the spindle of the yarn, or to touch a button to start the machine, or to change a piece to the machine for it to cut in a different way. All these are jobs that have nothing to do with the worker's ability. It is also very easy to replace this worker. If the worker does not produce what the boss wants, or if he wants higher wages, it is not difficult for the boss to fire that worker, because the boss will easily find a replacement. Before, when the skill of workers counted, the boss would think twice before firing the worker. Hence, the organization of work becomes more and more independent of the characteristics of the person that performed the work. The worker increasingly lose control of the process of production. With all this element that we have developed here, we can understand what is meant by productive forces of society. We could say that the productive forces are the energy the society uses to produce, or in other words, its productive capacity. This productive capacity is constituted by all the elements involved in material production, the labor force, the means of work, and the raw material we use to work. To the extent that quality of each of these elements improves, greater yields are produced, that is, the productive forces increase. Now, it's important to understand that the productive forces are not the simple sum of the elements listed above. Many times a mistake is made when calculating the productive forces of society by the amount of this element. For example, a society has 500 tractors, so many workers, and so on. But actually, the productive forces are not only that. It is true that the country that has more tractors gives us a higher index of productive forces than one that has less. But there are other elements. What are these other elements? To understand, let us remember what we said was the case when a seamstress passes from being an individual, a sole seamstress who works at home, to be in a seamstress who works in a warehouse along with other seamstresses. For the mere fact of the seamstress being next to each other, a sort of social stimulus emerge, which generates an increase in performances. And these performances increases even more when the work is divided. That is to say, when the workers become specialized in different types of tasks, the specialization produces a growth of productivity. The growth of productivity depends here, therefore, on the way that production is technically organized, that is to say, on the relationship that workers establish with the means of production. But although the sophistication of the instrument of production is a very important element in the productive performance, that is to say, in the number of goods produced in a certain time, the rhythm and the character that it stakes the development of the productive forces depends directly on the nature of the relation of production under which the labor process is developed. Capitalist relations of production have been the big instigator of technological advances in the productive process. As we will see in the next audiovisual, it was the logic of capitalism searching always more profit which promotes the Industrial Revolution. 
That implies the introduction of the machine in the productive process, transforming the workers into mere appendix of the machines to be able to exploit them more. The productive forces are not, therefore, the simple sum of the elements that compose the labor process. They depend on the way in that these elements are combined. We are going to finish this lecture with the definition of productive forces. Productive forces are the productive capacity that the society has. This productive capacity is related to the development achieved by the means of production and also is related to the way in which these means are combined accordingly to certain relation of production. We have then the elements and their combination. In Marx's work, we always can see these two things, the elements and their combination. And it is the combination that explains the essence of things rather than the sum of the elements which can be misleading. Mm-hmm.